Hey there, Alex Basso here. And Rudy, co-hosts of Game O'Clock. Don't split the podcast network's premier video game show. Every month, the two of us and a special guest go through a game genre's history, some of our favorites within it, some of our least favorite games, and where we hope the genre goes moving forward. We've talked about shooters, MOBAs, classic adventure games, and even more. If you like video games, you gotta check us out. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Educasso. Today on the show, I'm talking with Peter Clayton. Peter is an English teacher in Poland who is using Dungeons and Dragons to teach people some amazing English speaking. Uh, you know, it is really inspiring to talk to these educators who are using D&D. So we're going to hear this interview with Peter, and then next week we're going to hear another interview with an amazing English teacher named Sarah Roman, who is just doing some awesome things here in America with our high school class. Uh, but for now, we're going to hear Peter. It's a great interview. Let's roll it. All right, everybody. Now I am here with Peter Clayton. Peter, it is Excellent to have you here on Tabletop Babble, and you are bringing our academic credits way up because you are uh, one of the first educators we're having on here. Tell people uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games. Thank you for the warm welcome. I am uh, literally screaming out to, to everybody on the internet to try and show how RPGs can be used in the, in the classroom. But a, a little bit about myself. So, like I said, my name's Peter. Um, I'm a GM, first and foremost. So I GM usually games of like open legend RPG, things like that, a little bit of D&D. And then for my day job, I am an educator, like you said. So I live here in Poland. So as a native speaker, I teach English and help with conversational English and accents, uh, things like that, pronunciation. That's basically me in a nutshell. It is super, super cool to have you here uh, talking about D&D. So I, I love teachers. Uh, my mother was a teacher for years before she retired. So this is a, a big part of my world. And I think it's a big part of everybody's world. Uh, we've all been to school. We've all been taught by uh, some great and amazing people. And now that D&D, the thing I used to get yelled at for uh, reading the books uh, while you know I was in class and I, I probably should not have been, I should have been paying attention to science and, and history and that sort of thing. Now we are uh, talking about using D&D in the classroom. So before this podcast, we were talking, uh, you're in Poland and you said you're one of, you think maybe two or three educators using D&D in the classroom uh, in Poland. So how did you get the idea to use D&D in your classroom? Okay, so if uh, if you'll permit me, uh, I'd like to just do like a really quick exercise, like a mental exercise. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so what, what basically uh, it was by accident is the short answer. But uh, for those people listening in, uh, especially educators uh, or people curious, uh, if, if, I, if I just give you a very brief overview of how a teacher prepares and teaches a lesson, but what, what you want to do is when I say teacher, just in your mind, replace it with GM. When I say student, replace it with player. And when I say class, just replace it with session. Okay. So, so basically what, what I do as a teacher is I have a goal that my students need to reach for that lesson. So be it they need to cover a particular set of vocabulary or they need to talk uh, about a specific topic or get used to talking, you know, dealing with uh, customer service or something like that. So they need to practice their English with that. So I start with a goal and then I need to prep. So I need to, I need to plan a lesson that will last for like an hour to 90 minutes maybe of uh, something that's entertaining, something that uh, works, something that they're going to listen to and take part in. So basically uh, I plan it and then hopefully when I run the lesson, uh, I go into the classroom and and it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes uh, you have a, maybe a difficult student or you have a student that finds it hard to follow. So then you need to be able to adapt and pivot really quickly, which is where, you know, being a GM in my, my private time comes in really handy for that. 
So, so basically, that's that's the gist of what you do as a teacher. And I don't know if maybe people have picked up at this stage now. There are striking, like frightening similarities between being a GM and prepping a game, and being a teacher and prepping a lesson. And so, I suddenly it suddenly dawned on me that the the two processes are incredibly similar. Yeah, I I mean a hundred percent. So clearly, you obviously have some. RPGs in your background, right? Is is it safe to assume that and that that is sort of where you saw this parallel and you were like, these are seem surprisingly similar? Yeah, I mean, I like so, so I grew up um, like this is where I sound elitist now, but I, I my dad got me the the black D and D starter box, so it's like basic second second edition, I think it was, and. Uh, I was one of those GMs that I couldn't find a game. I didn't know anybody, so I became the default GM uh, or DM. And so I, that's how I got started in the hobby. My my wife then, she's been an English teacher for, for 15 years or more. And I sort of got into teaching through her when we moved here to Poland. So then, you know, so like I said, about six months in, I'm I, I'm used to prepping games and I'm starting to say, hang on a minute, I'm I'm doing pretty much exactly the same thing. So then I started to look deeper into uh okay, well what else? And and I and I was very careful. I didn't want it to be uh, you know, oh my ho- my hobby is cycling and I really like it. So I want to find some way to connect it to teaching. I didn't want it I wanted to make sure it wasn't forced. So I, I really did sort of look in. Uh, deep into tabletop RPGs and see if there was was anything uh, of, of extra merit that I could use in the classroom. And so what did you discover? How are you using D&D in the classroom? Like, in, in what way is it helping you teach? I'm just at the process now of trying to to frame it. What, what I've come up with, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing learning process for me, and I, I hope that doesn't stop. Right now, the way I've got it set up in my head is that there's there's benefits for the teacher. So, for example, as a teacher, and and I'm trying to convert my wife uh, to to GM in a few games. Like I said, sometimes you go into a classroom and a student maybe has already done something like this with a previous teacher, or you prepare uh, six exercises that you think are going to last the whole session, and they just plow straight through them. They're actually way better than you thought they were. Or sometimes they might struggle and you might, you know, have to spend the whole session on the first exercise. And it's the same as a GM when you're planning encounters. So when, you know, when you plan an encounter, as as you know, uh, some players, they are drastically underpowered for them. And you have to quickly uh, shift on the fly without them knowing and adjust the difficulty rating. And it's the same for being in a classroom. And also, you know, just the general skill of, I mean, not not to brag, but as a, as it, because I've GM'd for a while now, what I feel is it wouldn't be the best lesson in the world, but you could drop me into a class for 90 minutes without any prep, and I could wing something that was still of value to the students. And I think I get that from my background as a GM. So there's the, there's the teaching side. Then in the actual classroom, I mean, I could I could really chew, chew your ear off about this for about like three hours. <laughs> but just just a few things. Um, for example, character creation. Uh, one of my favorites. Uh, if you, one of the problems teachers have, and I'm sure GMs have as well, uh, is if you tell a student, um, okay, in this exercise you can do anything, or you can choose to say anything to your partner when, when you're when you're conversing with them. Like it, like in a, a game of D and D, if you tell your players, and if they're new players, you know you can do anything. You just met with this wall of silence, and mm-hmm. you know when you're a new GM, you're like, well, well, I'm letting them do everything, anything they want. Why, why are they so, <laughs> why are they so quiet? And it's because you're giving them too, you're giving them too much freedom. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's, I, I was at a talk recently by this great teacher here in Poland. She's called Agnieszka Aniała. I hope I'm not murdering her name. And she talked about creative constraints, and this is where you you set you set a, a, a set of rules that then it focuses the the person. So in this case, you do character creation. So for example, you want them to practice um, dealing with a problem at the airport, getting on a plane. So you say, okay, let's let's make up some people. And I use uh, sometimes I use another RPG called Rises, which you can literally just cook up a character in in about two minutes. 
Um, so you, we, scraps of paper, they scribble down maybe four attributes that they think this person should have. Like maybe they are really good at customer service uh, or they've got a bad, uh, bad temper. Maybe they, you know, characteristics like that. Then we, we get the ball rolling. And what I found is, and this is through actual practice and experimentation in the class, is those students that wouldn't, wouldn't talk or would be afraid to talk, they're not being themselves. They are being Larry. <laughs> You know, they are being Larry, who yeah. is bad tempered. They are being, I mean, and, and to, to ramble on a little bit more, say if you want to deal with somebody who's arguing politics, well, what do you do if you've got a class where everybody has the same political belief? Everybody believes in the same thing. Well, what you do is, is you create characters so, so that people feel comfortable playing, you know, someone who's maybe against LGBT. Uh, right, or maybe somebody who's uh, a closet racist or something like that. They know that they're not they're not being themselves because they disagree, but they can play this character, and therefore you can cover the dialogue and and give them the experience talking to somebody like that. There's there's so much. There's so much. Sure. Yeah. It allows people to safely step into situations that they will actually be in as adults, right? Like, uh, I know as an adult, I have actually had to confront people who have uh, racist or homophobic views. And so it allows the other students to safely do that and allows students to sort of see the perspective of these other humans and maybe try to figure out, okay, if they think this way, what is my best way to convince them otherwise or to argue against it or, or that sort of thing too, which I think is really great and, and uh, not at all, you know, I thought we were going to talk about sort of how people learned the, right, the basics in the classroom, not just yeah. how they learn humanity, which is what it sounds like you're talking about as well, which is pretty awesome. Well, this is the thing you, you can, you can basically uh, without, without bigging it up too much. I mean, we, as, as educators, we use, we already use games in the classroom, so you might use something like Dixit or, or uh, Storybook. Like there's there's little games you can use already, but uh, and and not to diminish those, but you just can't beat uh, tabletop RPGs because you can literally mold it into any scenario or any situation that you want to cover. So. Describe to me then sort of a typical day with D&D in your classroom. And it sounds like you do a variety of different things. How many kids do you have? How do you sort of organize it all? Because the idea of playing D&D with 25 children who have never played before is uh, terrifying to me. And I've got 22 years of GMing experience under my belt. So like, uh, how, how do you sort of approach, uh, bringing D and D into the classroom and getting everybody involved? That's a very good question. There's two approaches. Um, the first, uh, one approach is, and I'd love, uh, you know, the school that I work for to, to eventually sign off on this. But one of the approaches is you can, you know, to actually have a real, full-on D&D uh, &D, uh, RPG experience and people who want to practice their English come and take part in it. Um, what, what I do in my, mainly in my day job is I, I take elements of uh, an RPG and I use them as tools in the classroom. So, and, and in that context, like you said, now I've never had to teach 25 kids, although I used to, when I was at school, I was in a class of 30. Usually at, in, in my job, I'm teaching uh, classes of like, maybe 12 kids all the way up to uh, eight adults, uh, the elderly. So I, I'm teaching a, a wide range. Um, but to give you an example, again, creative constraints. So uh, you've given me a scenario there, which makes it easy to answer, my, answer the question. So the way I would approach this is, again, I'd, I'd start with some character creation because kids usually love to create. So I'd make sure that it was at the vocabulary level that they're used to, that, um, you know, if they're non-native kids. And I would give them all uh, sheets of paper. Possibly I I've got some pre-printed pre character sheets that are really simplified that sort of guide, guide them through creating a character. So maybe I'd hand those out and I'd say, we're going to make some, some people and you can do it with a partner and you can have a giggle and they can be as silly as you want. So we start out with that and then maybe we'd get them to share, one or two to share. You know, there's 25 kids, so we wouldn't get everybody to share. 
Um, so, you know, they'd say, oh, I've got, you know, this is Jeff and he sells bananas for a living and, you know, he's got a cat, but he hates crocodiles and things like that. And, you know, so they're, they're talking a little bit there. And then um, encounters, this is where encounters come in. So I would have some pre-made encounters. So, oh, OK, um, there is a fire uh, in a building around the corner and there's some people uh, uh, maybe trapped and you need to rescue all the people. So which character do you think is the best character to to deal with this fire uh, or which group of characters? So then we'll all talk and we'll say, well, maybe Jeff, he sells bananas. Maybe he won't be very good. But uh, Susan over there, well, she she's good at first aid. So maybe she can run in and help out as well. So, so you know, you're using counters in that way. Once you get people enthusiastic, like this can stretch on for, for a good while. And, and you know, and then in, in, in the middle of it, you as a teacher, you you do normal teaching stuff. So, you know, you, you cover new words. Uh, when you see a, a couple of faces that look a little bit clueless, you say, OK, well, look, this is what this word means. This is what this word means. And you, you can do other exercises, uh, regular exercises with them. But the fact is, is that you can you're using you're using the RPG stuff to sort of uh, get the enthusiasm going going so that they're learning without even even really realizing that they're learning and that's the ultimate goal especially when you're teaching kids that's great and so you're teaching english to non-native english speakers right yeah that's right that's my main goal over here that's excellent and it's amazing to see D. it sounds like you're <laughs> you're using it to get people excited and to start a conversation and uh that is just so fun and inspiring because i think D and D can be used in a lot of ways to do that, right? Like, you know, you can use D and D to teach math or writing, or there, there's so many subjects sort of encompassed in D and D. So this is a, a just a fascinating topic to me because I do think people are more engaged when they're doing something like playing D and D, or even when you're taking elements of that to solve problems and that sort of thing. And I think computer games and mobile games are becoming so pervasive that we also mm -hmm. understand some of those elements a little bit more than maybe we did in the 80s, right? Um, Absolutely. My shining example of that is Kerbal Space Program. I mean, you've got kids that are like uh, nine years old and they're able to explain orbital mechanics and <laughs> thrust, thrust to weight ratio and delta V because, because their rocket wasn't taking off. And they wanted their rocket to take off. So they did a quick Google search or watched a YouTuber. And now suddenly they have more education on ast is it astrophysics. Yeah, uh, they have more. Yeah. yeah, more education on that than the typical adult walking the street. It's crazy. <laughs> it's so exciting. And so I guess my question to you is how does D&D &D have an effect when you bring in these elements? Is there a difference than when maybe you weren't using the elements? Do you see engagement go up? You sort of talked about this a little bit already that you see people participating who maybe wouldn't have participated before because of the element of playing another character, right? They're not themselves. They're somebody else. Absolutely. There's several different angles from it. So, I mean, you, you know, with, again, with the character creation, with, with playing a different character, yes, that's, that's a big part of it, as we've discussed. So, um, you know, the fact that they can feel comfortable to play somebody else and maybe leak a little bit of themselves into that, whatever they feel comfortable. There's also the aspect that as a teacher, I'm passionate about it. And when the teacher is passionate, that comes across the enthusiasm. Uh, and also then you've got the novelty, the fact that it's not commonly used that much. I mean, there is a little bit of role play used in in, in language teaching, but it's more of a it, it, it's it's from a, that's coming from a different angle. Uh, so there's, there's there's many different facets to it that cause it to uh, to succeed in the class. Um, f f every every time I've run it so far, again not not bragging, but every time I've run it so far, uh, it has done really really well. And one of some of my favorite lessons are say when I do it with a business class or with a group of, uh, you know, older, older adults, like for example, and some teachers will, will uh, understand this when I say it, that, you know, you do get some classes that just, they don't believe that fun should exist in, in, in a learning, in a learning environment. <laughs> so, so they're there to do serious learning and that's the way that they've been brought up in their education system. So, 
So what you do is you, is you bring it in stealthily under the table. So, I mean, I, you can change a, a character sheet can become a CV, a, a resume so quickly. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. You've got, you know, you've got all the statistics, all the, the traits, the lists of skills, you know, so you can, you can change uh, or it can become a cover letter or something like that. You can change the materials and it's not even, it's not even, oh, I really want to use an RPG, but these people don't like it. So I'm going to hide it. I genuinely believe that if I can slip this under their radar, that they do actually, and, and they do, I've seen it, their, their engagement builds up and they accidentally uh, heaven forbid, start cracking a smile and having a bit of a, a laugh with their partner. So it's it, you know that that's that's another another aspect of it as well. That sounds just so great and so sort of inspiring. And I just wish that more people would sort of open up to that approach and use that approach. And I'm sure there are also some people probably have a complication with. Uh, parents who are like, why are my kids playing D and D? Why aren't they <laughs> right? You know, or, or or guardians or that kind of thing. So I I think that there are certainly challenges to overcome. But as more and more people integrate D and D and its elements into the classroom, I think we we see more things like that. Hey everybody, James and Jacasso here. Just wanted to let you know about our sponsor for this podcast, Cobalt Press. That's right, Cobalt Press who are the makers of such fine products as the Tome of Beasts, Deep Magic, the Midgard campaign setting. I could go on and on. Well, guess what? They have something amazing for you on the Dungeon Masters Guild, available in PDF and print. It's called al Genies. al is back! What is al -Kadim? Well, it's this area of the Forgotten Realms that has a very Arabian Nights flavor to it. It is incredible. Wolfgang Bauer, the Cobalt in chief of Cobalt Press, loves al -Kadim. Worked on it a little bit when he was over there working with uh, the old TSR. And now he is putting out more great content for it. In this case, it's 20 new genies, including Minor genies, huge sandstorm and oasis genies, and tasked genies. A template is also available for bottled genies. Check it out. It's chock full of lore. It is an amazing DM's Guild product. I am a big time proud owner of this thing and can't wait to spring some genies on my players. So check it out. It's called al Kadim Genies. It's from Cobalt Press. It's on the Dungeon Masters Guild. All right, back to the show. Did you face any sort of administrative hurdles like that or hurdles from, you know, I know you teach all ages, but were there people who were like, why, why is this the approach this educator is taking? Why not some other approach? Well, I think what, one of the reasons I've been able to be so brave with this is, and I'm not seeking a pay rise from my employers, but uh, I, I am given uh, a great deal of autonomy. Obviously, when I first started teaching, you, you get people that sit in your class, make sure that you're not, you know, uh, turning up and just uh, chewing a Snickers bar for half an hour while staring at the kids. So, you know, <laughs> once 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 they realized I was comp competent, as long as, you know, the, the students are happy and as long as they're learning, uh, they're OK with me to, to, to do all this stuff. And one of the things also we uh, as teachers, uh, especially as language teachers, you're a bit like MacGyver, like you are you are looking for any scrap of something new or although this is a this is actually a topic for debate in the community right now is about uh, it, do we always seek too much new stuff in the classroom? Um, and, and just to, to derail my answer there, uh, uh, I just sit, like to say that with RPGs, that's the great thing is there's so much of RPGs that is already in teaching already. Uh, that you, it's it's not really, in, in a way, it's something new, but it's also, it's like stuff that you didn't realize you were already doing, and you can just enhance that with, with the tabletop RPG. But uh, I've lost my trail of thought. What was the original <laughs> question? I, I ramble, I ramble, so you see, I get so passionate. I'm also having what I call a hobbit coffee, where 
uh, you make a normal coffee, but with a tablespoon instead. And uh. I'm just like, yeah, so I'm super enthusiastic about this topic. And nobody is, uh, you know, you, you're one of the first people to, to reach out to me about <laughs> it. So I'm just like, you've got to, you've got to hear all this stuff. You've got to hear all this oh, stuff. Well, I definitely want to hear all of it. It's so <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. So the question is like the administration, uh, have you run into sort of any hurdles with administration or parents or anything like yes, that? Yes, that was the question. Um, no, I have not. I've been very fortunate. Now, I can tell you what I would what I would do if I did. If you have the evidence on your side, then you're, you're usually uh, now, you know, I can't speak for every teacher out there. I know there are different schools and different teachers and, and the, the variety of students is infinite. So, you know, you are going to get all kinds of situations. But on the whole, I'll think of some some people that I've taught. Uh, I'll say, look, this this person here, they came into the class, they they went from not partaking in conversation very much or feeling shy, that this brought them out. And now when we go back and do the stuff where they are talking as themselves, they are more emboldened because they've got the experience and they've realized, hey, I thought it was going to be a horrific experience talking with a partner in this in this foreign language but actually I learned that it was fun and now I'm comfortable to talk as me so you know you have you you have that aspect of it so you know I'd say uh, the administration like I said I've been very lucky they in all the schools I've worked at and all the teachers I've worked with everybody has been very open-minded and has just let me do what I want to do uh, with you know if I encountered any parents or any any people complaining I'd say look just look at the results, you know, judge the results. And if you, if you think that it's still not good, then of course we'll talk about, it. and you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to force any system on anybody. So, you know, we can do, we can do other things, of course, but generally speaking, it's, it's, it's going really well for me so far. And I've, I've been messing with it for about three, three years now. So uh, yeah, it's, it's going well, touch wood, touch wood. It sounds like you're making a big difference for people. And it sounds like you have plans for the future and you're adapting and you're changing, which I think is amazing uh, work that you are doing here and you're seeing a real impact on the students. What are some things that you take from RPGs that you, you haven't gotten to use yet? Like what are, your, what are some of your future plans as far as integrating RPGs into the classroom? Okay, uh, I love this uh, this question. There's my big mothership project, and I, I don't mean like I'm promoting something. Uh, this is just something I want to do, which is uh, the the one aspect that I've not talked about yet is is the the biggie that I call it, which uh, is probably the most difficult to communicate to teachers who haven't an experience in an RPG background. But I, I look forward to be able to, to to talk to people about it. Is the is world gen now? Uh, you might think, well, uh, world gen, yeah, what you get them to maybe make their own world up or something like that. No, n not really. Um, I Right now I'm experimenting with a system called Open Legend RPG, uh, which is, uh, it's like uh, setting, is it setting agnostic is the term? I'm not sure. But it's, it's, it's you know, you can go any time Wherever period or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And and I find for me the best results you get is, is to set it in a contemporary setting so that you can explain expose people to, you know, going on holiday, uh, dealing with somebody at a, a customer service desk, uh, returning a product to a supermarket, all that kind of stuff. So what, I, what I'm working on at the moment is, is my own campaign setting. So it's going to, you know, it'll have superheroes in it for the kids, but it'll be set in a, a contemporary setting. And that's the big thing for me. Like it's, it's the genius of a tabletop art. RPG for teaching you can when you when you it's like the matrix when you own the world when you define the entire world that the people are going to interact inside of you can you have complete control over which way the the lesson goes with with regards to that angle so you know you can drop you can drop a bunch of kids uh they get shipwrecked on a desert island and the natives only speak in past tense or they will only respond if you use a certain set of vocabulary. Uh, you can you can drop uh, you can drop them into the middle of a city, and they have to deal with a villain who uh, speaks in riddles, uh, or who speaks you know in in some really it, he, one of his the only way to make him angry is you know he speaks with a lot of errors, so you have to correct him on his errors. And they, well, I'm just like coming off the top of my head here, but. You know, uh, so I'd like to roll out a campaign setting 
that is specifically designed for teachers to run. They can put people in and they can, you know, they'll have, have what we call lesson plans, but they're actually, you know, as we know them in D&D &D, uh, adventure modules that they can run in a classroom for 60 minutes, 90 minutes for a certain number of people. And it will cover a certain aspect of the curriculum. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm looking at right now, but that's like, I'm just at the very beginning. But that's, that's, that's where I'm going, hopefully. Wow, that's really, really cool. I love the idea of a setting that teachers can use. And, and I also love that idea because you can keep putting out adventures then, right? That, that teach various uh, lessons and subjects and things like that. That's really, really cool. Please, when you are ready to launch that, like come back so we can keep talking about it because I think that would be amazing. Um, and I would love to help you with that in any way that we can over here. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about sort of playing RPGs in your free time. Do you have a lot of time to play RPGs these days? I know when we were setting this up, we, we had to talk. You're also a, a parent and you're working. And I know that, you know, you have a partner who works and everything like. Do you have any time to play RPGs these days? Oh, yeah. Now, now we're getting into the... We're getting into those questions now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, actually, you know, recently I uh, I dealt with a bout of GM fatigue, you know, where you, like I, I was oh, running yes. a campaign and I'd just become a new father and, and I had some great players. I was doing it over Roll20 and, you know, you just get to that point where I was running games on only three hours sleep and that I'd prepped the night before. Uh, and it just like, eventually you're just like, hang on a minute, I'm supposed to be doing this recreationally for fun and it's not fun anymore. So you crash and then you, you look at yourself. And I went on um, recently, about a month ago, I went on the, the community forums for, for Open Legend and I said, look, I've had this big meltdown, this big uh, GM fatigue incident. And uh, a lot of people gave me some great advice. And one of them was just, just have one session a month. So uh, since I've started doing that, uh, uh, the games have become fantastic. I've got a new bunch of players uh, that I play with them once a month, four of which have never played RPGs before. And uh, they they left just like on cloud nine uh, when they left the apartment uh, last session. And I've got another session coming up with them on Saturday. Uh, so I've got my own custom uh, world, which is like really badly written, but it's 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 fun to exist in. Uh, and, you know, we, so we, you know, it's a typical fantasy, uh, you know, swashbuckling type setting and we just have a lot of fun in there. So now, now that I've learned to, uh, um, pace myself and to, you know, I, I got my wife to help out. She takes, she takes my daughter over to, uh, to my mother-in-laws and they have a nice day out there. And, you know, that Saturday once a month is my, my little Saturday with my friends and, and yeah, everything's going well so far. That's great, and it gives you a chance to, you know, uh, play test some stuff maybe that you want to use in the classroom and that kind of thing too. So that's really, really great and amazing. Uh, you said there were sort of – you could talk about this all day. Is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you feel like we should hit? I'm totally down to, to keep talking about it if you have other stuff that you think we should mention. I have a very scattered mind today, but, so I'll, I'll probably hop all over the place. The first thing I want to say is – and, and I'm not I'm not just being polite, like, thank you so much for covering this. And also, you know, uh, the, the fact that um, I think you, you were telling me also that, you know, you'd like to you'd like to talk to other educators that are doing similar things. I, I I'm a, I'm an English teacher, like as a native speaker. So I, I specialize even within the English teaching world, I specialize in a very specific thing of English conversation. And I, I am I cannot wait to hear from math teachers and physics teachers and and all kinds of uh, other people from different areas to hear how they uh, achieve effects, you see. Because it's one thing for me to do it from the language angle, but I, I want to hear from them how, how they're applying the principles to, you know, like explaining biology or something like that. So I'm really looking forward, I'm really looking forward to, to that. There's one lady who's been working here in Poland. Uh, she has a blog called thatisevil.wordpress.com. Uh, she's very nice. She is called Monica Kisawa, and she has uh, written a ton of posts on using RPGs for teaching. Uh, I don't know if people want to track me down on Twitter. I'll I'll tweet that out later. 
because uh, that's a really good resource for teachers if they want to go and find out a little bit more about this, because uh, I haven't written too many blog posts uh, yet. I would like to try and get something on Roll20 and also something in the real world where it's, instead of being in a classroom, it's an actual uh, RPG game where people come who maybe aren't confident in using their English very much and they want to polish it. And so they, the priority then is on playing the game first and when they encounter dialogue or language that they, they're unfamiliar with, we can stop and we can say, okay, this is this and this is what it means. So I, I want to explore that aspect. And uh, just a, a sh one guy on Twitter, and I forget his name on Twitter, but this might be interesting to you. He's in Amsterdam. He reached out to me and said that he taught himself to speak better English literally by flicking through the books uh, because he his friends were playing this RPG. I I'm not sure if it was D&D &D or not, but he was, you know, he wanted to play with them and it had all these crazy words, this, this terminology that you don't use in day-to-day -day life. And he sat down and he, he basically, using the books, he says he greatly improved his English and had more confidence then to speak because he knew all these uh, extra fancy, complicated words. So I found that very interesting when, uh, when he tweeted me there. That's really, really cool. I love, you know, I play a ton online and it never occurred to me that you could use Roll20 as a virtual classroom. That's incredible. What a great idea. Wow. Uh, you are blowing my mind, Peter. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Peter, where can people find you on the internet if they want to learn more? What's a, what's a good way for them to reach out to you? Okay. So, for me, uh, so my Twitter handle is Mage Your Day. It's a play on words. So, it's Mage as in the wizard, M-A-G-E, Your Day. So, Mage Your Day. Uh, that's the best place to get me. Um, I have a page on Facebook, uh, which I also check. Um, I hang around in the Open Legend community forums a lot. And also, uh, I, have a, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel. I recorded six hours of talks and footage on my thoughts on this and then realized that the audio wasn't syncing with the video and it looked like a really bad kung fu movie. So I lost all of that. So I've got, I've got an empty YouTube channel right now, but if you go and subscribe to it, I am going to put some content on there about this topic at some point. Um, being a father of an eight month old, I have to give schedules like, you know, at some point or in the near future. Um, but it is, it is on my to-do list and one of my goals. Um, and you know, one of my goals was obviously, you know, to reach out to people, uh, like yourself and try and get the word out. So I I mean, that's that's basically my goal. Uh, I also write for a blog uh, about RPGs in classrooms. It's called mellifluousenglish.com. Uh, uh, again, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tweet that out on uh, Twitter because it can be quite difficult to spell mellifluous. Yeah, that's basically how you get hold of me, really. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Tabletop Babble. Uh, people should definitely check out everything you're doing. Uh, and uh, Major Day is probably the greatest Twitter handle I have ever heard. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me, Peter. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you. And, and thanks for letting me ramble on on about anything and everything for the past, uh, past hour or so. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. That was an excellent interview with Peter. He is doing amazing work. The work of Paylor over there in Poland. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Peter. I do hope we get an update from you. If you like this chat, you're really going to love next week too when we talk to another educator about how she's using D&D in a high school classroom here in America. So check it out. You know... Tabletop Babble isn't even a year old, and you can help us grow. How can you do that? Well, you can go leave us a five-star rating on iTunes. That's right. Just leave us a five-star rating, and it will help tons of people find the show. Not just people using iTunes. Those other podcatching apps, they're using the iTunes algorithm. So even if you don't have iTunes, go make an account for free. Rate us. Rate your other podcasts. It'll be great. Plus, if you leave us a five-star review, I will read your review out loud on the show. You can make me say anything you want. Today's five-star review comes from... Alikes, 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 Alikes. 
And this review is entitled, Surprised. Uh, I think. I mean, it's a five-star review, so it's a good thing, right? Right? Uh, and uh, a Lakey says, I've been surprised at how good the podcast is. Most gaming podcasts are more rambling and empty banter than substance, but I've been pleasantly surprised by this one. I know. I disappeared after that first edition. Life and death got in the way. But I've loved the feel and flexibility of 5th edition, and I've actually started writing again. That's awesome. Good for you, Alakus. Alakus. Alakus? Even better, I found a gaming podcast with substance to replace Save or Die, which is on permanent hiatus. Thank you, Steve Marsh. Oh, Steve Marsh, I should have uh, read this beforehand. Uh, You are awesome. Thank you for leaving this review. Uh, I'm really glad you found the show, and I'm really glad we were able to pleasantly surprise you. People, please go leave us a review. I'm getting to the end, the end of my review rope, and I need things to say during this segment. You know what? But I am going to tell you about one more podcast on the Don't Split the Podcast Network that I love. It's called Game O'Clock. That's right. Rudy Basso, who is the amazing co-founder of this network, and his brother, Alex Basso, who does tons and tons of work for the network, have a show together called Game O'Clock where they talk about video games. And it is really, really good. There's a lot of video game podcasts out there, but what these guys are doing is really special, really fun, really amazing. Listen to it as every month they do a deep dive into a different video game genre. In fact, yours truly was on a few episodes uh, back in the day when they first kicked it off. So check that out. Game O'Clock on Don't Split the Podcast Network. People, you can follow me at James Intracasso on Twitter, and you can check out everything I'm doing in the world of game design at worldbuilderblog.me. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget that RPGs are like sex. You're going to want to make sure that you clean off the kitchen table before you get started. Hey, it's Mike Shea of Sly Flourish and author of The Lazy Dungeon Master and Sly Flourish's Fantastic Locations. My show, The DM's Deep Dive on the Don't Split the Podcast Network, features a one-on-one discussion with guests like Sean Merwin, Enrique Bertrand, Teo Sabadia, and more. Once a month, we dive deep into a single D&D topic and answer your burning DM questions. Watch us live on Twitch, on YouTube, or on our podcast on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Let's dive deep.